morning is upon us. If you want to go back to bed, nah, that's not the time to do so. Welcome to the Morning Brief. I'm Kayode Okikiolu. Wake up, get up. It's uh, your second alarm here already. Remember, you're stronger than you seem, braver than you believe, and smarter than you think. So get up and go get your dreams, starting with hanging out with us for the next two hours. Good morning and welcome to the Morning Brief on Channels Television. I am Bukola Koka. And as you kick off your Monday, make up your mind to a few things. I always say choose to be happy. But in addition to that list, choose to be kind to someone this week. Make a deliberate effort to be kind to someone. That's exactly what we'll be doing today, to be kind to everyone. That bring you all the big stories that we've been tracking over the weekend and our outlook for the week. Welcome to the program. I'm Jeffrey. Uzama. You know, for at least the second year running, you've had the Lent season and the Ramadan uh, yeah. season uh, basically coming together and overlapping, as the case may be. And, I mean, we know the population of the country is really uh, big on both religions, the majority of our population. And both of those seasons essentially preach lots of things, piety, kindness, uh, even uh, being in touch uh, with providence and all of that. So I think we all should take a cue from that and take it beyond just what the monks say and take it to other parts of the year as well. So it's like a, a lifetime thing for us, not just during Lent or Ramadan that you get to be respectful, kind, and all of that. It should be a lifelong thing. But to uh, Christian Muslim brothers uh, undergoing a fast, I uh, wish you very best, I wish you a successful uh, fasting period because the Ramadan begins today. Mm. Exactly. So uh, it's, it's a time to reflect on the essence of the season, which is what we always advocate about. It's about sacrifice. It's about love for mankind, love for humanity, love for God, whichever faith you subscribe to. It's about that time you sit down and we usually we use that word sober reflection. There is a reason because amongst in the midst of all the chaos we go through, in the midst of challenges we go through, at some point you need to just chill, relax, tell your soul and yourself, hey, let's sit down for a moment and have a conference. I call it self-conferencing, self-retreat. Ask yourself a certain question. It will make you a better person, trust me. Uh, well, speaking of um, piety, love, uh, add to that discipline right. and kindness that you've talked about and the need for it to be added all the year round, not just during the Ramadan. Also remember that, you know, times are hard already for those who increase the price of food items indiscriminately. This is not the time to do so. We know that the realities are upon us. Uh, but then again, uh, people are finding it hard to feed already. So during this uh, fasting season, Season, uh, we need to be sensitive to the needs of our people. So uh, let's not choose this time to increase the price of commodities indiscriminately. God, one of the things that just crossed my mind as I was talking, my mind, I can't, I, can't, I can't seem to take my mind off the fact that children are still in captivity. It, it's been bothering me. I've listened to, I was listening to the radio while driving down here and people keep talking about it. Innocent children, what exactly did they do wrong to us as a people, as a country? that they went to school and did not come back, not out of, out of their own volition, but because they were kidnapped. This is a time for the government and everybody to take responsibility, at least for these children. Over 200 people mm -hmm. moved to where God knows, we don't know. Um, it's sad, it's been difficult for me to process it. Uh, but hey, it's what it is, but we do, we just pray that the government will act right and do the best they can to make sure those children are out and this we will always say it should never happen. Well, what is more difficult to process, uh, pardon me, Kadi, is a report indicating, according to the governor of Borono State, that some women may have returned to their abductors. So what could have informed that? Um, are their abductors more kind to them? Do their abductors provide more food than what they have at the IDP camps? Are the conditions you know, where uh, their abductors have put them more livable than in, in their IDP camps? So many questions. So right. many questions. Uh, is Difficult. it a form of mental slavery? Uh, uh, do they feel more comfortable with their abductors due to one reason or the other? I, I think we should reflect on it as a nation, not just at this level. 
Oh, and that just dovetails essentially into what we have for you on the show this morning. You still get to hear uh, more on that, answers to those questions more importantly. But uh, here's what we have for you on the show this morning. For the next uh, couple of hours, actually just less than two hours, exactly. this is what you'll be seeing on the show. Now for too long, Northern Nigeria has grappled with the spate of terrorism, banditry, especially with debts and kidnappings, most times in the most unbelievable manners. And barely three months into 2024, one will think we're reliving 2014 all over again, where over 200 girls were kidnapped in Chibok. Now, who are the actors? What do they want? And what must we do? Those are some of the questions we'll be asking this morning on the show. Mm, more than 20 years, and it looks like a cycle that refuses to be broken. Well, that'll be 10 years, actually, but yeah, yeah, it is a long time. It's a, it's, a, it's a long time. Well, from that, we move on to the power sector. We may have had uninterrupted democracy for 25 years, but we can't say the same for power supply with successive governments promising to fix the situation. But today, the combination of the generating transmission and distribution companies continues continued to under deliver leaving homes industries struggling to keep up we find out if and when we will get uninterrupted power supply exactly well that's not all not just trouble problems and all of that today on the show we will be you know taking the conversation a notch higher bringing you that very exciting part you know where we talk about the soft side of things you might have heard of the saying that says you know big things or greatness comes in all kinds of packages and that's true for our guest on the show today. Who is challenging stereotypes and breaking boundaries and barriers with his one acting, second comedy, and exceptional brilliance? You find out what's the secret of his drive and some of his backstories you may have never heard. We have all that on the show today. You will love to be right here to find out about this very big guy. Absolutely. What a package we have for you. But as always, we're taking your comments uh, from just about 7.20 or thereabouts. So all of those uh, things you have to say, send them in. We'll take that all through the show. Send them in on WhatsApp with the number which you see very soon on your screen. There you go. That is the number to send your messages, your questions. If you've got videos, compelling videos, whatever's happening around you, if it's traffic, if it's mm -hmm. um, something you just find interesting, send them in let us share that with the world you can also just do this on social media across all platforms hashtag ctv morning brief don't forget for the whatsapp number which is right there on the screen it's just essentially messages and videos and don't do calls we're not taking them just yet you can call busola <laughs> <laughs> It's all going to be mischievous. You can call Bukola after the show but don't call it now because i hear a lot of people say i want to speak with busola Okay. <laughs> it's not good to be mischievous, can it? <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'll just speak with Bukola, but you can do that right after the show. So send in your messages, your comments and questions. We're here for you, Bukola. We'll be right back after this time out. <laughs> During the break, I'm going to discipline my younger brother. The morning break, guys, we're back to the Our top stories on the brief, it's officially the first day of Ramadan. As a Sultan of Sokoto and President of the National Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs, Muhammad Saad Abubakar yesterday announced the sighting of the crescent moon, signaling the commencement of fasting for Muslims in the holy month. The Sultan made the announcement at his palace in Sokoto after receiving and verifying reports of moon sighting from Muslim leaders and organizations across the country, which were duly authenticated and verified by the state and national moon sighting committees. The Christian was earlier sighted in Saudi Arabia on Sunday. After the Indian uh, most novel Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is equivalent to 10th March 2024, marks the end of Shaban 1125 after India. And the reports of positive moon sighting were received from Muslim leaders and organizations across the country, 
which we usually accept it. Consequently, tomorrow, Monday, the 11th day of March 2024, becomes the first day of Ramadan 1445 after the Hijra. We therefore call on all Muslims in the country to commence fasting accordingly. <laughs> we call on all Muslims to use the glorious month of Ramadan for extra prayers for our leaders in our country, Nigeria, and for more dedication to the worship of Allah, why would Allah? And now to governance. To the claim by Senator Abdul Nigi that the federal government is operating two versions of the 2024 budget, a statement which has rattled not just the presidency, but the other key institutions of government as well. Well, in this reaction, the presidency has described the statement as false. And according to a statement by the special advisor to the president on information and strategy, Mr. Bayo Onanuga, it says that contrary to the strange view expressed by Senator Nigi, there was no way the Senate could have debated and passed a 25 trillion naira budget that was not presented to the National Assembly. But the presidency also described as far-fetched and unbecoming of a leader of a status the claim by Senator Nigi that the 2024 budget was anti-North. But that's not all. Three senators, Steve Sunday Karimi, Titus Tetengazam, and Kakashio, have also dismissed the allegation of budget padding by Senator Abdul Nengi as unfounded, baseless, and a figment of his imagination. The senators, in a statement on behalf of the Northern Senators Forum, warned against what they describe as the antics of blackmailers bent on creating an atmosphere of crisis in the upper chamber of the National Assembly. The three senators say they cannot be used to blackmail the budget process, which was done in good faith. And the Labour Party says it remains the only option to credible leadership, which has been the bane of a country's development. Over chairman of the party, Mr. Julius Abure, gave this position at a press briefing in Lagos, where he expressed delight over the many victories won by the party, despite what he calls various campaigns of calumny against its leadership. He also adds that the Labour Party is in support of the implementation of the RSI report, which he claims is long overdue. We have over bloated civil service, we have over bloated agencies where we waste our money, waste our time, waste all kinds of resources on those agencies. So Labour Party is supportive of the Orosaye report and we are looking forward to its full implementation. I think it's a right step in the right direction. More so that the life of Nigerians have not improved. And I think I've spoken to that when I was making my remark. The country has not improved in terms of economy, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of health, in terms of education. All aspects of our lives is still in a very, very chaotic position. And therefore nothing has changed, nothing has improved the life of the people. And as it stands today, Labour Party still remains the credible alternative. And now to the subnational level in Lagos, the governorship candidate of the People's Democratic Party PDP in the state's 2023 election, Abdulaziz Adenero, who has been out of the spotlight for a while, says the party's misfortune in the state is being orchestrated by disloyal members within the party whose stock in trade is to work against the party for selfish reasons. He calls on these alleged disgruntled elements to leave the party instead of working against its progress. But let me correct an impression. We didn't lose 2023 election because we didn't work. No. That is why I'm here to appreciate all of you. We are more than this. We are my heroes. We did very well. Another one that I need to say to you. We did not lose 2023 because some people within the party chose to do other things. No, that's not why we did. That's not why we lost. No. 
No. What they did in 2023, they did not do it because of Jando, because they have issues with Jando. No. It has been their style every election circle. That's it, that's, it has been a way of life of them every election circle. In 2019, the same group declared to support ADP as against PDP candidates. 2019. Are you a Jando was not in PDP at that time. Yes, 2017. 2017 for local government election. Yes. Labor. They worked for Labour. Yes. Yes. Same PDP leaders in Labour states. That's the Lagos PDP governorship candidate Abdullah Ziza did on speaking there. Away from Lagos, a five-story building has collapsed in the Onitsha area of Anambra State. Well, the chairman of the Anambra State Physical Planning Board, Mr. G.K. Madweke, disclosed that the approval given was for the construction of a three-story building, but the developer went contrary to plan and started erecting a five-story building. No life was lost in the collapse, which has been described as partial. Meanwhile, Governor Chikuma Saludo has threatened to sack the Transition Committee Chairman for Ogbaru Local Government Area, Pascal Anyaguna, for allowing the construction of a fence on a space designated as a walkway of a major road. During a road inspection in the state, the governor was visibly angry as it demanded to know who approved the building whose fence covered the walkway along the Ododo Cool Road in Okoko under Ogwaru local government area. He then directed the LG boss to pull down the building or he will be sacked. You stop it, you come and bulldoze it down. If I come here again and I see any of this rubbish, I'll sack you publicly. You're incompetent. No, they began this They began it and you are watching it going on and you didn't bring it down. Where is the walkway? Come and show me the walkway. Come and show me. So you bring it down. You stop it and it's going on. Look at it. 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 Coming out on the road. Who changed it? Who changed it? This must go back and you have at least one meter where people can walk. By tomorrow, this wall must be off. And they must go at least one meter up there. And they get me the paper who approved it. And I'm sacked that person tomorrow. Get me whoever, if anybody approved this, that person is leaving my government tomorrow. Okay? Let them get me who, who, who approved this thing to be done this way. And I will dismiss that person tomorrow. Get me the paper. Well, Governor Soludo, talking tough there. We'll follow up. Uh, to see if uh, those particular words are followed through with. But let's talk business now. The Nigerian Employers Consultative Association, NECA, has commended the federal government for putting on hold the implementation of the Expatriate Employment Levy, that's the EEL. Mr. Dewalis Mato Yuride, who's the Director General of NECA, in a statement particularly commended the Ministers of Interior and Industry, Trade and Investment for their roles in putting the EEL on hold. He adds that while the association appreciates the objectives of the scheme and the need to address gaps in the management of expatriate employment in Nigeria, he asks government to deepen engagement with stakeholders, including organized private sector. The ministry announced the decision on Saturday in a post on X. And outside Nigeria, Ukraine has strongly rejected a call by Pope Francis for Kyiv to negotiate an end to its war with Russia and have the courage to raise the white flag. Ukraine's foreign minister says it will never raise any other flags than the country's blue and yellow colors, while the country's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, dismissed the comments as virtual mediation. A Vatican spokesman later said the Pope was speaking of stopping the fighting through negotiation and not capitulation. Well, sports news is next. It rained gold for Team Nigeria at the 13th African Games holding in Accra, Ghana. As uh, the game 
essentially saw the country picking seven gold medals in badminton and wrestling events yesterday. Where first to pick Nigeria's gold is reigning champion Anoluakpo Payori, who defeated another Nigerian, Godwin Nolofua, in the badminton men's singles final. And then Mercy Genesis filed out in the women's 50 kilogram wrestling event to win gold. Christian Ogusoya also won gold in the women's 53 kg. And the gold medals kept coming in. Odwayo Adekoroye, Esther Kolawali, Blessing Oborodudu, and Hannah Amuchechi all swept gold in their various events. Well, congratulations to Nigerian athletes. And ahead of the Paris 2024 Games, the mayor of Los Angeles, Karen Bass, has paid a visit to the Olympic Village. Now, Bass in the company of Matteo uh, Hanutin, who was a mayor of St. Dennis, is impressed with how the organizers were able to infuse diversity, culture, and manage to prepare for the Games without overshooting their budget. The 2024 Paris Olympic Games will hold from July the 26th to August 11th, while Los Angeles will host the next Games in 2028. So the diversity here, culturally, but also economically, so that there will be market rate as well as affordable housing that's here, I think is a great example. And now we need to see how we can help accelerate some of our projects that are already underway. But it's an opportunity also for our council president and council members to weigh in. This is very, very different from Los Angeles because, you know, in Los Angeles, we're not building an Olympic village. Uh, our athletes will be housed at UCLA. But uh, this is just a wonderful example of how the Olympics can help be a catalyst, fast forward projects and a vision that was already underway. Oh, there you go. Top stories. It was also a big night at the Oscars. Of course, uh, some of the big wins we'll be bringing to you on the show this morning. Plus, your comments and contributions. It is that time. And of course, Bukala joins me as we walk through some of the major talking points for you over the weekend, uh, of course, spilling over into today. Bukala. Yeah, well done, Coyote. Some of our first few talking points make it into the trends this morning. Speaking of foodstuff and kindness. And uh, we're starting with kindness. President Bola Tinubu is being commended for ordering the return of seized food items to their owners. And the first thoughts uh, come from farmer. Farmer at web3 underscore farm says a touch of kindness and practicality from president bola tinobu uh, that's the love love icon there his decision to return the seized food items to their rightful owners is not only fair but it also helps to ease the economic woes of the border communities and boost the local markets well the question is will it there you reduce go. I, food smuggling mm, in the first place so uh, it was important to also different say between export and, and um, smuggling. smuggling. Yeah, and I true. Think we raised that point. This one is a I am Fizzle one two three. Saying the question is how do they return it to the owners? Where is accountability of the owner of the goods seized? And who says the goods are still intact? Mm. And this one is from One Nation. One Nation says the question should be: Will the Nigeria Customs Service do it for free? They might demand a service fee, make them no lose out totally. Oh. That's another practical question. Well, Zumat is quoted, very interesting name, says, uh, while the intent and all is appreciated, I'm concerned about the execution. Will there be proper monitoring to ensure the food really reaches the local markets? Okay. Hashtag accountability, hashtag Nigeria. Olani says, we hope to see compliance in the coming days because it's easy to give orders in Nigeria, but will they be obeyed? We're talking about the an order from the president of the commander-in-chief so we believe that uh, the director general of the customs service should execute this order right well it's a no-brainer really mm -hmm. but <laughs> hey things happen yeah things happen sure uh, particularly with people still asking uh, customs uh, to give a response uh, to the investigative work done by Fisaya Shoyombo, some of those issues raised. So you'll understand why a lot of people are skeptical because, uh, well, in recent history, they've not exactly seen uh, some of these agencies forthcoming. Mm -hmm. We have PJ underscore 121 saying, the problem is documentation. Was there any documentation of the seized food items owners? I want to believe there should be one. Or in this case, 
a lot of documentation. Sure, and that goes back to your point that we've emphasized on on the program about differentiating between exportation of food mm. and food smuggling. So if the uh, importer or exporter has documentation, then the customs service should be able to produce it and you know be accountable about this process. Yeah. Was it smuggling? Was it food exportation? Speaking of food, Zionid says, and that's our next theme, the price of foodstuff and the level of heat in Nigeria, they do competition. <laughs> That's uh, the skyrocketing, skyrocketing price of food and the heat we're experiencing uh, competing in terms of, you know, the way Nigerians are feeling it. I hope I captured the meaning correctly. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, let us know. The next one is from Iduze. I hope I got it right. And uh, it's a very interesting angle to this book. It says, despite the smuggling activity, we still have enough food with us here. What is lacking, I imagine, you're trying to say, is a purchasing power. Mm -hmm. Without government intervention in farming, food foodstuff are not cheap anywhere. So, is that really the, the is that situation? really the case? Is it not? Because we had um, an African too farmer. Too much money chasing too few goods. But you know, from his thoughts, it would be. Uh, very little money chasing a lot of food. A lot of food, right? So uh, supply is outweighing um, demand in his own estimation. Well, we'll have the economists clarify that for us. <laughs> um, because we've heard farmers saying, well, uh, we're not even at the worst part yet. We're coming to a point where there might be less food supply. So uh, for them, they will say food supply is a challenge, really. Availability, supply, and rest is a challenge. But uh, for Duse says, he believes uh, that we still have enough food here with us, and it's just the money that is missing. Take a look at this one, uh, Bukala. Mufa Muwafak Damfulani yeah. says, Ramadan is already here, and foodstuff prices in the market are still high, I believe, and not pocket-friendly. You know, we talked about that earlier on. And we've, we've seen what happens during Ramadan, in how prices seem to go up, and we're coming off a period when prices are up already. So the question is, will they get higher? Higher. Price? Mm. <sighs> Richie 001 says the way foodstuffs are getting more expensive in the market. God help my people all. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Okay. Uh, up, up to the next theme now, and it's on petrol or the oil sector, if, if you would have it. Um, NNPC. Oduma starts and he says Aramco is reporting profits while NNPC is constantly reporting losses. They both deal on crude oil. I saw this video, or rather this comment over the weekend, and uh, well, I understand where a lot of people are coming from, so let me just take more of those comments. This one is from Zane Africa, and this is what uh, Zane Africa has to say. Uh, NMPC made trillionaires <laughs> in Naira, that is uh, what you're saying. We can make more than $121 billion after rehabilitation of oil refineries by focusing on ending pipeline vandalism with not only human security, but applying automated security with advanced technology. Saudi Aramco tracks every droplet of oil and pipeline vandalism from their control tower. Automation prevents insecurity and human error by 80%, Zane Africa says. So I like this angle because I know a lot of people were flogging the NNPCL saying, see your mates, in a manner of speaking. I mean, that's the Nigerian term. But also, this prefers solutions, and I think I like that. Well, the, the gains may not be as much as, much as we expect, but uh, there's some return on investment following the account given by the NNBCL GMD some months back during the Senate hearing, saying mm -hmm. that they have begun to make some remittances to the Federation account. And now that we have a private security firm, you know, um, you know, protecting the pipelines. What are the gains from there? We need some accountability from the company managing Nigeria's oil services. Well, this next one is from um, o o Only Tega, underscore Only Tega, and they say, having looked at Saudi Aramco's numbers over the last five to six years with the kind of profits they're declaring, I'm forced to ask if it's palm oil or vegetable oil NNPC is selling. <laughs> Well, it's neither of both. So that is a look at your mate <laughs> uh, comment I was comment. talking about earlier on. Uh, it's understandable uh, what people are saying. So 
Uh, those are some of your comments. Don't forget, you can keep them coming in. Hashtag CTV Morning Brief. But this video, which you may have seen earlier, also trended over the weekend. And that's uh, Governor Chikuma Soludo uh, in that exchange with the LG Transition Committee Chair. It's gotten a lot of people talking. Different angles to this. Uh, some said, uh, you know, let's just let you listen to it uh, one more time. That happened on Friday, I believe, in Ogbaharu local government area. like some drama and Nigerians love their Nollywood. <laughs> well, he made so you'd understand why the a lot video of trended. Have yeah. Different angles to this. So he made that promise, that vow that whoever is responsible will be sacked. So that was on Friday. Uh, I've not seen so far a report of that sacking. So maybe it's been done. It's not been widely reported. It's another case entirely. But there are different angles to this. We'll call it quickly. Some people say that was embarrassing <laughs> that in public uh, for the transition committee chair, who, by the way, is Pascal Ayebuna, that's his name. Some other people think, well, let it be done, it's governance anyway. So where, whether it's in public or in private, ensure that whoever's responsible is reprimanded and appropriate sanctions meted out. But another category but, of people, yeah. they're not even involved in that back and forth. They say, wait a minute, so can we do this for those we elected as well, <laughs> as people? Can we tell them if you don't deliver, we're going to sack you? Mm. Well, good, good points, but you must look at it also from the broader perspective. What's been happening? What's the backstory to that? How many more areas carry such um, implementation of a poor town planning arrangement? Yeah. So uh, perhaps those are the issues. All right. There you go. So those are some of the things you're saying. We're going to go on a quick break now. And when we return, we'll get into one of the big stories of the day. Concerns. You know what? Wait for it. It's a morning brief. Stay with us. I am here at the behest of His Excellency President Ola Ahmed Chilibu to emphasize, to solidarize with the government and people of Kaduna over the sad incident of the kidnapping of our school kids. The president was personally pained by what happened. And he has instructed the security agencies to leave no stone unturned until we return our kids back to their parents. <coughs> it's a regular contract with the governor of Kaduna State. Today so far, he has spoken with the governor four times. He has spoken with me three times about how far with the rescue of the kids. Nigeria's Vice President Kashim Shatima speaking uh, about the Kaduna kidnapping uh, just a few days ago. It's been four days now since 287 students were kidnapped in Kuriga 
Kaduna State. And no, this is not 2014. We're in 2024. But you hear what they say, the more things change, the more they remain the same, sadly, particularly for insecurity in Nigeria. But let's get some more insight into this. We're joined by Dr. Kabir Adamo, who's MD, Beacon Security and Intelligence Limited, uh, joins us virtually on the show this morning. Uh, Dr. Adamo, welcome to the Morning Brief. Uh, well, if you could just unmute uh, so we can hear you. My apologies. Good morning, Coyote. Good, good morning. Welcome to the Morning Brief, Dr. Adamu. Uh, as I said earlier on, you think this was 2014, but we're not in 2014. This is not the Chibok case. In fact, in less than a week, we've had way more than the Chibok incident. We've had in Kaduna four days ago than we had in Borno State as well, even though there's some controversy around that, particularly from the government side of things. But the point is, this is alarming, it is shocking, it is unbelievable that you have that amount of people uh, being kidnapped. I, I don't know, there was global opera during Chibok period, even national opera. This actually cost the government a uh, second term. But from what you've seen with the kidnapping, with the response, is there something we may be missing yet again? <sighs> Dr. Adam. Um, yes, uh, Coyote. Um, I mean, I, I feel you. I feel your emotions. And I think that is the sentiment that a lot of Nigerians share. Uh, I listened to the parents of some of these abducted people. And I mean, for, I want Nigerians to kind of try to situate what happened. Um, kids went to school in the morning, just around this time. And in the traditional manner in public schools, gathered themselves for the assembly and it was during the assembly that this uh, gunmen surrounded the school and we're talking of kids between the ages of probably seven up until 14 15 16. they surrounded the assembly area uh, and literally herded these kids away um, their parents um, were could see them some of the vigilantes that were located in uh, Kuriga could see them. In fact, one of the vigilantes who attempted to stop them using the dang gun that he had was shot by the bandits. And that's how they had it over 280 of them into the, into the forest. And of course, four or five days into the incident, um, they, they're gone, literally. I, I listened to some of the, the parents. I heard their cries. I listened to the traditional ruler uh, of Kuriga. I heard his cry. I listened to the governor of Kaduna State. I saw his pain. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate uh, what happened in 2014. It's repeating itself in spite of the fact that from 2014 till date, we have at least three policies that the government over this period has attempted to implement, starting from the um, safe school initiative to the safe school declaration, to the most recent one, which is the national policy on safe schools, um, and then of course its implementation policy. So, um, in simple terms, I I, I don't want to miss my word. Uh, there is no accountability within the security system. Uh, I, I mean, you are pressmen. I, I haven't had. Perhaps you have had. Who has been held responsible? Um, the police does not have um, uh, formation. The only formation it had was shut down. Um, nobody has been held accountable for the m missing 280 kids. I don't know of any country where you will have something like that. And then we'll just move on as if it is ants that have been herded into the forest. So it's, it's in simple terms, it's, it's just unfortunate. Well, Mr. Kabiru, uh, besides uh, accountability, it's, it's also, it's like deja vu. If you recall, either it's Chibok or Dapchi, or Kagara or Kankara, it's the ease with which the terrorists are able to move that mass of women and children. And, you know, at the onset uh, of this administration or before it came to power, there were a lot of promises that things would be done differently. What are you seeing, you know, that security agencies are missing, that we haven't seen a significant change in approach to doing things such that we won't have this anymore? Um, so Bukola accountability is in two uh, components, mainly um, account, the financial accountability and then the operational accountability. Uh, what is missing is that sense of responsibility. Um, 
the element you refer to is principally intelligence. Uh, the, the details of what we're hearing at the moment that it's possible this government moved from somewhere further up northwest. I, I don't want to mention locations because the issue is still ongoing, but that's what we're hearing. And that, that is us, just private players. Uh, we do not have the kind of intelligence collection capabilities that the government have. But if at our level we're able to gather this, then I'm, I'm hoping that the government would also uh, at least uh, show that level of responsibility and step in and start harvesting the intelligence that is out there. Uh, some of these kids escaped. Um, and I know that some of them have been debriefed by by common people like like me that is not in government I, I i i can't really understand why we're not seeing that by now i expect that a war room some situation center would have been set up uh with live collection of these types of intelligence with the um, analysis of this type of intelligence and of course with the uh, dissemination to various elements um, I haven't had that yet. If it's happening, then I would be very delighted. If, if it's not happening, I am hoping that uh, they are listening to us and they will set up such a center and make it um, 24 hours and make it as effective as, as, as possible. Because the intelligence is there. I don't want us to keep ourselves about that. It's out there. It's, it's just waiting to be harvested. And in this type of instances, the earlier you move, the better. If you allow time to pass, um, then, I mean, Leah Sharibu is still there in the hands of those uh, monsters. Um, some of the chief organs are still there. Uh, where at, at the moment, in my, in my organization, we've documented about 465 kids that are students that are in the hands of these monsters. So we don't want that number to increase by uh, these new um, numbers that have just been abducted. Mr. Kabir, what, what are the elements missing in? what you describe as operational accountability or, or operational responsibility is it lack of police formations within those communities because any 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 um nigerian would wonder if distress calls were made to uh, the police to the army why wasn't there any response quick enough to save or to, or to check uh, the, the monsters from taking the children uh, to their locations um, so, in, in simple terms, and because I'm mindful of uh, the audience, uh, imagine drawing a line, and then you have six points on that line. Now, that is what every good security system should have, and that is what is missing in terms of the operational accountability. And I'll quickly mention them. In security balance, we call them the three Ds, and then the, the three Rs of security. If you match them up, they make the six points on, on that line. So number one is the ability of the security system that has been implemented to deny the enemy the ability to take uh, its targeted uh, you know, interest, in this instance, students. Um, so that ability was totally not there. These guys came, they surrounded the school, and apparently the school does not, did not even have a perimeter fence which was one of the elements <coughs> contained in the policy that we have at the moment on, on safe schools. Um, so that's number one accountability. Who should have constructed that fence that he did not construct the fence? The second element is that is the ability to deter. In, um, now, different from deny, that, ele that ability to deter means that the perpetrator will be afraid that even if he does, he will be arrested. And so he says, OK, this is too dangerous. Let me allow it. And that, that is principally our, our, our criminal justice system that is failing to arrest and punish offenders. So um, criminals are able to perpetrate crime, frankly, with no consequence, as, as it were. Uh, there's, there are so many things um, related to this second element to deter. The third one um, is the ability to delay. So assuming the enemy thinks that, OK, the price is very, very important. He's going to get, you know, billions of naira, or trillions of naira from that. And then he, you know, dumps the two consequences. The first, um, deny and deter, and then he still goes ahead. The system should have the capability to delay him, which brings us to the next three elements, which, which are the three R's, the response that you spoke about. Now, because of the spread, Nigeria is such a big country. You want to have the ability to respond. And in security balance, we say that ability should not be between two, maximum to 15 minutes. Now, depending on the consequence of that target, the ability to respond should be between those minutes. In this instance, <coughs> failure completely. They, they carried out that incident for about 45 minutes from what we had. Like I said, they are, the parents of these kids could see them, literally. 
and they cried when they, when they saw them because they knew what was going to happen. And frankly, nothing happened because there was no police formation in that location. So in terms of accountability, uh, if, I was, if I was given the chance to investigate this, why did the police withdraw from that location? Why didn't they put an alternative arrangement? And we're not just talking of the police. There are 29 ministry departments and agencies in security uh, that should have some level of responsibility in this element. Now, the fifth one, that is after the incident that happened is the review component that which is why i spoke about setting setting up some, some form of an um, emergency center by now you should be reviewing what went wrong who did what who didn't do what and then you take actions and the idea of that review is to allow you learn from your mistakes Chibok happened, Dabchi happened, um, Kasina, several schools in Kasina, in Niger State, in Zamfara happened. We have enough lessons that we should have learned from in this review process. And then the last one is the recovery um, component from all of the uh, first five. You, whatever you learned, the mistakes you made, you implement them. Now, in simple terms, this is the security um, you know, structure that should be in place that, frankly, we don't have at the moment. So when we talk of operational accountability, and this, these are the one, two, three, up to six that I would sit and ask myself, out of these 29 um, MDAs in security that we have, who, which, which one is responsible for one, two, three, four, five, six? And then I would take the necessary action. Um, if they are not uh, willing to walk, we, we, we either show them the exit door, or in certain instances, we even penalize them, because for God's sake, uh, these are our kids. Uh, I'm just sitting here thinking about <clears throat> how traumatized, how much of fatigue is hitting Nigerians when we see these numbers. Because as we talk about this, this Nigerians are tired of filibustering. At the bottom of this, in unit terms, we're talking about souls, human beings, and even to worsen the situation, these are children. And so the natural question will be, are we really brutally honest enough to begin to look for a solution when it comes to this issue? Because they say, if you're not brutally honest, you're not going to have national healing. What exactly is the driver or the, what are the enablers of this? Because it's one too many. It's, we've asked all the questions. What else are we, have we not asked? Um, there are several enablers, um, but I'll be brief and I'll just mention the most important ones. Number one is the perpetrator. We know the perpetrators. These are gunmen that we popularly call bandits or, if you like, terrorists. Uh, we still don't have an anti kidnap framework in Nigeria. It's sad. Um, you know, we've talked about it uh, for years, but we still don't have one. I, I want us to, you know, at least start from that basis. Uh, because we don't have an anti kidnap framework. And, and the good thing which I'm excited about is that if you look at the renewed hope agenda of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, it's contained there. Uh, that there, there is um, a statement um, that points to the fact uh, frameworks will be devel developed for each of the six geopolitical zones um, to address peculiar challenges in, in, in them. And so I'm hoping that the coordinators, and there are six of them, would very soon, in fact, uh, I, I hope that by now, they are already developing a framework to address that. Now, because there is no framework, we are seeing a haphazard creation of um, security structures by the subnationals. And that in itself is a challenge. Um, when the excitement was that several states, Kaduna, Zamfara, Kasina, Sokoto, most, the most recent one is um, Sokoto, uh, have created state-level security structures, a lot, uh, um, most people were excited. But I cautioned. I said, well, um, there is a need for caution, um, mainly because there is no framework. I doubt if there is any federal uh, MDA that you go to now to tell them to give you the details of the operatives that are in this um, subnational, um, you know, structures, and you get it. There, there is none. Now, what has happened is that several people have been co-opted into these subnational structures, and in co-opting them, uh, the three elements that could have made them effective, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion, have been missing. The second element that is missing is their training. Now, because of that, we're seeing a resurgence. Starting, they, they, they were recruited with a notion that certain ethnic groups are responsible for the crime that we're seeing in the part, northwest part of the country. And because those, that particular ethnic group was not included in the recruitment, you now have a situation where they are targeting that particular ethnic group. And naturally, that ethnic group would seek to arm itself. So there is a competition, as it were, at the moment. 
for influence between the, the various um, you know um, um, subnational structures that exist. So that is that is one in, uh, enabler. The second enabler is the existence of ungoverned spaces. In the case of um, the uh, um, Kuriga incident, they moved the kids into the forest. And since then, they have been moving in the forest. They will probably end up in that, that particular state where we're hearing they, they, they came from. Uh, and so that, uh, the fact that we still don't have any mechanism for dominating on government spaces is the second enabler. The third enabler is their ability to move. They came on motorbikes. At least that's the intelligence we were able to gather from the villagers. And they moved from, like I said, a particular state in the Northwest across several, um, probably t uh, up to almost a thousand miles. So if there was capable intelligence, we could have harvested their movement and prevented where they were going to, or even stopped them before they reached that decollation. So that's number, number the thought enabler, the inability to prevent the movement of these persons on motorbikes and the inability to harvest in intelligence. Of course, the fourth enabler is the response capability that we spoke about earlier on with, with Bukola, because even if they were able to move and arrive at that location, if the response capability was effective, would have been able to, to stop them. Um, so in, in summary, these are some of the enablers that have allowed this to happen. You can talk about the fact that there are they, had, they are still able to have access to um, petroleum to put in their bikes, to travel up to maybe four, five hundred, six hundred kilometers. Um, you need, you need um, petroleum to put in those bikes. And then, of course, even after the incident, to move back to those locations, they need petroleum. So this, in summary, are some of the enablers. How about the communication? They still are able to communicate among themselves. Someone is controlling them, and they communicate through, most likely, mo mobile phones. So this are... Uh, in reality, some of the enablers, and I'm shocked. You know, I'm sure you'll be wondering uh, while I say this, what, what are our security agencies doing? For every enabler I mentioned, there is a security department that has a mandate to monitor that particular enabler. And that, that takes us back to my earlier point about accountability. Who is um, asking questions? regarding the inability of this particular security department to implement those enablers or to, to prevent those enablers. You know, the, the more you talk about this, the, the more it doesn't seem to make sense because you, you break it down so well and you're like, it doesn't make sense, it still doesn't make sense. And part of me, I keep, I keep saying this because these are children, these are human beings. We've said that time and again, almost sound like a broken record. They are herded, that's the word you used. If you were to herd cows, that much cows, I mean, you, you, it would take some effort, 287 cows. You know the effort it will take. I, I mean, it will be tough to herd that much cows across that length of distance, not to talk of children in Bornu, in this, this case, Kaduna. You talk about enablers. There are also community enablers. I don't know if that's something you want to speak to, human enablers, because I think it was the governor of Bordeaux State that said, you know, some of those women actually went into the bush themselves. Now, whether he meant they went to the bush to get firewood or they willingly went to the bush to meet the terrorists that kidnapped them is another thing entirely. But I'd like to bring another slant into this because we've heard that uh, during the month of Ramadan, there's usually some sort of reduction in the activities. We've had a former DSS official saying that. And I wonder if you see, I know we shouldn't rely on you know periods for us to fight in security, but it looks like that's where we're at right now. So do you see some form of uh, reduction now that we're in the holy month of Ramadan. Again, I've heard people say, well, some of these bandits are not even, uh, you know, believers in Islam. They're not adherents anyway. They do not pray and the rest. But having Ramadan come into the mix, do you see any change whatsoever? So, um, Coyote, it depends. Um, at the moment, and I'm mindful I'm in a public space, but for the essence of what we're discussing, I'll mention it. There are two campaigns that the global franchise, um, the Islamic State, is running at the moment, and that is impacting Nigeria. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, this, so the, the possibility that that global franchise will issue uh, a statement, what in Islamic um, parlance we call uh, fatwa, uh, in other words, calling on their global you know, franchises across, across the world to carry out certain activities is there. Uh, and that means, as a country, we need to have our intelligence um, capabilities uh, monitoring such statements, and not only monitoring such statements, monitoring how the members of this global franchise 
not just in Nigeria, but in the Sahel region, are responding to those state statements. Now, for now, we haven't had any statement from the global franchise, either uh, Islamic State or Al-Qaeda, regarding Ramadan. What, what they have spoken about is the conflict in, in Gaza, the conflict between Israel and, 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 and Hamas. Um, now, that is likely to drive into the period. And, you know, the Americans have tried to make sure that there is some form of um, peace, uh, you know, could call it whatever, before Ramadan. Unfortunately, it hasn't happened. So it's very likely that we're going to see a, a response in that regard. Now, all of what I'm trying to say is that intelligence and security are transient. We should never lay back. That the, the lethargic approach that we have, where we kind of just wait until they happen, that, that's not security. Um, security should be forward looking. Intelligence gathering should be as wide as possible. And then, of course, uh, we should be able to put in place. I mean, our power, our power infrastructure is being attacked um, over time. How many of us have wondered what is happening? Um, again, I, I want to mention that there are two campaigns that are ongoing and our security agencies and intelligence uh, you know, bodies should wake up and not just uh, understand what is going on, but put in place measures to prevent um, them from happening. I'd like us to take a, a critical look yet again at the statement by the Borono State Governor that reports indicate that some of the women probably return to their abductors. Um, does this, for you, I wonder where you think about it first of all, and then does it leave a question mark on the government's de-radicalization and reintegration program because some of these women were housed in the internally displaced persons camps? Um, well, the truth of it is a, an industry has emerged that is supporting um, some of the security challenges that we have in the country. Uh, is it terrorism? Is it the kidnap for ransom? There are industries that are supporting it. And some of these industries are there as a result of the both social and environmental challenges that we have in Nigeria. Um, now, Operation Safe Corridor, which is one of the most um, prominent and I think globally recognized uh, components of our counter-terrorism um, strategy. Um, sadly, and I say this with all sense of responsibility, there hasn't been any independent evaluation of its um, you know, progress or lack of progress as it were over a period. So it's very difficult really to assess it and say whether it's been successful or not. Everything we hear is re we're relying on the implementer and you can't rely on the implementer to give you um, the facts. There has to be an independent evaluation and it's high time. It's so I think about a decade or over a decade that that program is being implemented. Now, with regards to the situation in the Northeast where we've seen almost 80,000 or more um, persons you know, uh, surrendering um, family members and um, the, 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 you know, operatives of either the Jamaat al-Alisin al al jihad or the Islamic State in West Africa province. Um, in that instance, I think the Borno State government is dealing with a lot. It's very difficult to handle such a huge number. And when you keep them in camps, um, some of them together with the same persons that they, they victimized, then you can see the social issues that will emerge out of that. Now, that's number one. Number two is the livelihood issues um, that uh, surrounds that. With the current economic circumstances in Nigeria, those livelihood issues are also increased. Those people are complaining that the food they're being given at the camp is not enough, so they have to go out to fend for you know, their livelihood. Uh, in this instance, wood, because that's what I had. That, the particular incident in Gamburu in Gala, they went out to look for wood. And so it wasn't like they deliberately went out to meet their abductors. It's possible that one or two of them, as a result of the Stockholm syndrome, or even as a result of abandonment, or some of the challenges that, of resentment that would come from their victims within the camp, may still you know, go back there. Uh, point I'm trying to make is there are several um, issues that have emerged, and that as a country we have not addressed um, you know, holistically. Uh, so the governor's point may be correct, but it's simplistic. I think we need to be a little bit um, diverse in terms of disaggregating the issues so that we understand the various elements that they may have led to them. You can't gather people in, in a camp, not feed them adequately, and then stop them from going out to fend for uh, their livelihoods. They are, one has to give. Either you provide enough security that will allow them to have their livelihoods, or you feed them enough for them to stay in that IDP camp. 
So when you look at what happened on Christmas Eve uh, on the plateau, almost 200 people killed, and in general, another set of people killed, and then what happened in Baranu uh, recently, and this one with the children, uh, it's almost ludicrous to look at the Nigerian state and say, a day overwhelmed. It's not a question you naturally should ask. But looking at the ease of execution, as Bukola has said, it's difficult not to believe that we're overwhelmed as a people. So uh, my question is, is the punitive measure uh, being put out by legislation insufficient to deter this bad behavior? Because it's an assault on state, and the state seem not to be wielding enough big stick. Um, so when I was mentioning those six things, I talked about deterrence, which is actually number two. And um, interestingly, when we saw that game between the Senate and the security leadership, where they came, they met them, and then there was a spin doctor among them who, you know, just spinned whatever he spinned, and the Senate could not even, uh, you know, interrogate him. Uh, the, the, the reality is that uh, the, the kind of um, seriousness that the security sector oversight requires, we're, we're not seeing that. And so uh, I, I wouldn't use the word overwhelmed, but I would rather say there is a politicization of the security function in Nigeria. That politicization is being played out consistently. Um, when the Senate uh, issued a vote of confidence, as it were, you know, on the security sector leadership, a lot of Nigerians, because I mean, I, we try to measure in Beacon, we try to measure the perception and the confidence as it were of Nigerians. And in measuring that perception and confidence, one of the things that we saw immediately after that parley between the Senate and the security se sector leadership is that incredulity that I'm seeing in all of you here. A lot of Nigerians were asking the question, hey, how come the Senate is giving a vote of confidence on these guys? When in that month alone, my, con my company recorded a 1,022 deaths. In the month of February, we recorded almost 800 deaths, and yet there was a vote of confidence. Now, I'm not saying that the security sector leadership are not trying. They are, they are trying. But that, um, you know, gum that will bring their efforts together and show progress, it's, it's not there at the moment. And the reason is this. You hear the statement, we need a whole of society, and then we need a whole of government approach. Uh, I must say, with all sense of responsibility, we, as, as, at, as at now, don't have a whole of society and don't have a whole of government approach to managing security at the moment. The president has beautiful um, elements within the um, Renewed Hope Agenda and several other documents that followed the Renewed Hope Agenda. But this implementation is lacking, and I think the managers of the various elements of our security component, especially the administrative structure around the president, they need to wake up and look closely at those little things that, are, that would tie coordination, cooperation, and collaboration within the security sector so that right. when things like this happen, we can nip them in the butt, we can hold those that drop the ball accountable, and then we can move forward as a nation. Well, Dr. Adam, let's wind down with this. There's a lot to act upon, not even ponder upon now. And I mean, we should act as far as yesterday. Uh, there's a lot of comments coming in on this conversation. A lot of Nigerians are shocked and bewildered, uh, as you are. But um, why don't we just get some of those messages up? Uh, do you agree? Because you said there's been no legislation properly on kidnapping. Do you agree with the wife of the president who says that there should be capital punishment for kidnapping? Um, it's not as simple as that. Uh, there are three things that you need to do to manage any crime situation. Uh, number one, you need to understand what is driving the perpetrators. So we need a sociological study immediately right. to understand. So um, the second one is we also need to increase protection. And then the third one is to reduce the ability to enjoy the benefit of the crime. So, so, it's you, not don't, just about so you don't support capital punishment? Uh, no, like I said, it's not as simple as that. In certain instances, cap capital punishment, but not in a circumstance where even the judiciary, the role of the judiciary is questionable. Right. Um, at the moment, I have about 500 and near, there are about cases of missing Nigerians who have been arrested and who's um, aware about our known. So imagine such a situation where the, someone just slaps abduction on them and then they're, they're, they're killed. No, uh, there must be a process. That, that's what I'm trying to say. We must sanitize certain other components before right. we reach capital punishment. All right. Well, Dr. Kabira Dabu, MDB Con Security and Intelligence Limited, thank you for the insight which you've provided uh, on the show this morning. Thank you for having me.
Uh, if we could just make, quickly run through some of the uh, comments we've gotten. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, take a look at this one, Julius <coughs> Ferima, uh, that's from Lagos. It says the government is not just serious at all. How can 287 girls be transported to a certain location and that location won't be known? How do they feed them? How do they go about the logistics for these large number of students without intelligence to look at this very hidden location? And this is from uh, Therese Ahua, no location, uh, by the way. It is obvious that these evil mercenaries are now trying to give the government the, uh, the give Tinubu the treatment they gave Jonathan with the Chibok girls. So this is our own view. I hope the security services are on top of this. This is obviously a ploy to destabilize uh, the country further. Why carry out such heinous acts against schools, children, women, education, all of that? No one is ever held accountable or to account for these happenings. This is unacceptable. Well, this one is from Victor Umar, and Victor says... Good morning. Does anyone understand how over 200 children are abducted and taken away from their school? I mean, how? In a bus or buses and no one can track the movement of such a large number of human beings? Amazing, indeed. Yeah. That's from Victor Moore. Well, that is not the amazing that we want to hear. It's not the good amazing. It is the shocking and wild kind of amazing. But we'll go to break now. Keep those comments coming in. We'll be taking them during the course of the show. Hashtag CTV Morning Brief and, of course, on WhatsApp. We'll go to break now. We'll talk about another situation that has been on for decades. I'm talking the power situation. You're probably watching this without power in your home and your office. So it concerns you and I. Stay with us. I have never called for an outright removal of electricity subsidy. And I'm saying it again. But it will be quite insensitive for anybody, not even a political office holder, to call for that at this very moment in our nation's history. We make the subsidy payment prompt so that there will not be debt piling up, hanging on the neck of the players in the industry. Oil generating companies, oil gas supply companies, I mean, we know that it is not good for the industry. And we as a government, the good news is that we are already trying to achieve some success. Well, welcome back to the program. Another sector that leaves Nigerians equally befuddled as security is the power sector. With power grid collapses, uh, the reforms in the sector that has seen uh, the sector now managed on three tripods, transmission, generation, and distribution, uh, yet we've gotten... Uh, not so far as expected. Uh, where are we headed now? Uh, what reforms will take us to our uh, uh, preferred destination as far as, as far as power distribution is concerned? Joining us to have this conversation is Dr. Ayodele Oni. Dr. Ayodele Oni is the yeah, he's a partner energy practice group, Bloomfield LP, and he's also a commercial lawyer, energy law and policy. Good morning and welcome to the Morning Brief. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. Yes. Um, under the new administration, the power minister has made you know, quite a number of suggestions, although we've heard him clarify now that he has not particularly called for uh, the removal of subsidy in the, in the electricity sector. But what is most recent uh, is uh, the call for the withdrawal of licenses of uh, power distribution companies. Do you agree that this was one of those things that will bring sanity to the sector? Uh, well, it depends on how, how you look at it. Uh, I think it's a tough decision. T tough decisions need to be made. I think in some cases it's justifiable um, to have the right people run some of these businesses, but you wouldn't leave everything at the doorsteps of the discos. It's, it's across the value chain. We've got challenges from gas on 
up to tr distribution. It looks like as we try to resolve one problem, uh, that one raises its ugly head. So uh, to an extent, some of them should have that um, withdrawn, but of course that's, that's the duty of the regulator, not, not the minister. The minister is for policy. Of course, it can give general policy direction. Maybe that's a general policy direction. So yes, to an extent it is. Because but but there, ha there are reports that uh, the transmission company generated a total of 1,769 megawatts of electricity between February 1 and February 14, yet the distribution companies did not take it off for distribution. What are the challenges in that mix? Okay, uh, that's interesting and that's also a bit historical. This is what happens when you get light uh, in, in the feeders, that's for distribution companies. The, those feeders f um, service certain street certain areas. If those guys in those areas do not pay for electricity, there's a lot of say energy theft, uh, bypass, they have minimum remittances under um, the MITO, under um, the rules. So regardless of um, non-payment by consumers, distribution companies still need to pay for that power regardless because they have accepted it. That's why you find out that in some cases they do not even want that power because they won't be able to recover um, mon uh, monies or, or tariffs from the consumers. Now, it goes to uh, the entire structure. I mean, our market design on paper is brilliant. And that's the thing about Nigeria. You have brilliant people, brilliant policies, brilliant documents, but implementation is where everything crumbles. So that, that's what that is. The feeders, certain feeders, they don't want like that because they believe the consumers won't pay. That's a challenge with that particular issue. So you and I also have a, a role to play, to be honest. So we have 13,000 generating install capacities from what we know. But before we get to complexities, Let's simplify things for the average Nigerian. You talked about the value. We have the generating, <coughs> excuse me, the transmission, transmission as well as the distribution companies. Now, walk us through what is the role of, it's, it's, it looks like it's general knowledge, but I'm sure you have a bit of insight beyond what is on the surface. The average person believes if it generates and is transmitted, why are they not distributing just like you answered? So maybe walk us through what is the average generation? What who is transmitting and what that actually means? Because everybody seems to know what the discos do. Just for simple education, because we need to posit this and know whose responsibility is what to know who to hold responsible. Okay, I'll start this way. We've got broadly speaking two sets of um, generating systems. We've got thermal, that is largely gas. 80%, over 80% of generation is gas. You've also then got hydro. You've got three hydro plants, but two hydro companies, Shiro and Kenji, you know, but there's also the Jeba plant in the mix. They generate and then transmit. But fictionally, there is an institution in the middle known as the NBET, the bulk trader. I'll tell you why this is the case. It's historical. When they were going to do the privatization, no one was going to invest in the generation companies, no one was going to buy them because they said each time power was sold to the distribution companies, they, they're not able to recover. And recall that money flows from down up. You and I, industries, everyone pays the distribution company, which directly or indirectly pays everyone else, market operator, embed, and all that. So government had to put in the middle an embed for what is known as a partial risk guarantee so that they provide some form of guarantees to the generation companies, the new owners, that if the distribution companies don't pay, um, under the PRG arrangement, you still get paid. So they generate, but because that generation is at very high voltage, the transmission company takes it and then steps it down. The distribution companies are able to get it stepped down and it goes to ohms, you know. But in, the, in that middle, the PRG thing didn't work as planned by the government. So when distribution companies, when you and I don't pay distribution companies, or there's a technical challenge, they don't recover enough to be able to pay everybody else. So that's what works. Gen, you generate, you transmit over long distances. It, it comes down to distribution companies who then pass on to factories, industries, and everyone else. But the, the key guy 
is a distribution company for me because in terms of um, finances, because they collect from everyone and then settle everyone. That's generally the way it works. But there are, of course, other options. Now we're moving more and more towards a multiple buyer model where distribution companies and in, in its Q3 report and particularly the MITO 2024, the multi-year tariff order, the regulator NERC has said that discos should go and look for other means of bilateral power. Because MBET is, is, is nearly illiquid, right? If not actually liquid, if we're being uh, mild here. So they can't even pay um, for electricity because they are supposed to do the collection, um, there's some arrangement for the MO and all of that, and everyone gets settled. They cannot even pay the Jenkos. They're supposed to collect from the discos because they're like the middleman that fictionally buys and resells through vesting contracts to distribution companies. So across the value chain, there have been those challenges. Gas is one. Historical challenge with gas, such that during the time of what used to be NEPA, National Electric Power Authority or never expect power at all, um, <laughs> they would take gas and not pay for it because they were government, so to speak. By the time you unbundle the uh, power holding company of Nigeria, please hold your candle now, you then add a situation <laughs> where people's, where it continued and billions and hundreds of millions of dollars were owed gas distributors. Imagine you were supplying something to someone on credit and that person continues to, um, owe you so much money and accumulate debts. You're going to cut off one, two. There wasn't sufficient investment in gas infrastructure. You know, we're one of the, uh, in terms of gas reserves, we have huge gas reserves, both non-associated gas and associated gas. But because there was no investment for several years, and because they weren't paid for gas, demand was also low, commercial arrangement was poor, now we see the effect of no gas. Government has been trying to help at some point a few years ago, they did pay some of those funds, but it's accumulated again. So we said 80% of our generation is gas fired, right? So no gas, you can't fire. Now transmission, between 1987 and about 2012, 2014, there was no major grid enhancement, no infrastructural development. So imagine in 1987 with a population of 60, 80 million, you had a grid that can take carry say for 4,000 or, or less. You do nothing to it for, for nearly two decades. <laughs> no magic. Some of these problems are historical. So while I, whilst I'm not holding fault for this government, I do not necessarily think it's the right. government, gov, current government's fault. So that's the problem with transmission. Cannot take enough. So you have 13,000, depending on which statistics or data you also look at, mm -hmm. 13,000, 23,000, whatever it is, you have stranded capacity because the transmission um, network cannot then carry. Then you get to the dis distribution, um, also lack of investment, right. you know. The privatization to the queries, to my mind, I think it was a good idea, but how it was done in hindsight, maybe it could have been done differently. That's, that's what it is. Those I, are the challenges. I wonder then you and IT steal electricity, right? No, I mean, I, I my, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure no, nobody in this room does. <laughs> I don't do that. At least yeah. I can vouch for that. I don't know what uh, name you give discos because you've given Nepa their name, given PHC. <laughs> yes. I don't know what you call disco now. But it just goes to show how long this problem has been with us. We're doing, I think the minister said, 4,000 generation or generating just over 4,000 megawatts when he just said that we need about 30,000 or more megawatts. And this morning I was reminded of Sound Sultan song, the late Sound Sultan, God bless his soul. And when we ask our government, when they go give us light, they say in 2010. 40 years after 2010. In fact, some people will tell you that Obasanjo had also promised that in 2001, that would have some semblance of uninterrupted power supply. We've had uninterrupted democracy, but it's not the same for the power sector. A lot of Nigerians don't really want to know, want to understand is it Genko, transmission company or disco. What they want is stable power supply. What would it take? as a matter of now, to get Nigerian stable power supply. And i like us to be very frank, <clears throat> because I know there are some areas that people don't want to go into because of being politically correct, they don't want to step <laughs> on toes. If you say people have to pay much or pay more, people will be like, do you want to kill us? If you say that we need to withdraw licenses, this will say, ah, uh -uh, do you want to get us in trouble? So I know there are those areas, but I want us to be as frank as possible because we can't keep doing the same thing and expecting uh, different results. That's madness, literally. So Dr. Oni, help us out. Okay, um, I think um, the first step is um, policy and, and the new law. 
Um, I understand that there's a consultancy um, consultation paper that will be out in the next week or, or two um, that would give some guidance as to where we are headed. But there's the Electricity Act. The Electricity Act now allows states, of course, flowing from the constitutional amendment, now allows states to legislate on generation, transmission, and distribution. That would be part of the solution. Um, distributive generation or distributed generation where you'd have smaller units. Now, the problem then is that people may begin to cherry pick and say, okay, in VI, in Ikoi, in Lekki, people will pay. In other areas, what then happens? I, I, I've thought of some solutions, e.g., I think the distribution companies will also be forced to sub-franchise now first, and, and I thought of a concept, the Oluomo concept, sounds, sounds interesting, right? Um, you know, if you look at these guys in the informal sector, the NURTW, there's a way they enforce their rules amongst themselves. So have some franchising in those areas where you think they can't pay, have a situation where people are forced to pay, and you, you also reduce electricity theft. So I think it's a combination of... by forced to pay? Okay, forced to pay, um, the way we have, the way amongst um, those unions, they have a set of enforcers that would come on and announce to check what's happening. We may need to be not conventional. If we re remain conventional, the news items you read in, in 1978 is what you read in 10 years from now. If we remain con conventional, we need to do what isn't usual. And, and I'm sure you've thought about this. Harvard principles will work in the US, will work in the UK, will work in Canada, will work even in South Africa. You bring it to Nigeria and it falls like a pack of cards. So I think that we need to be unconventional. I think we need to promote more distributed generation. Everyone needs to work hard around the transmission system and have milestones for me. Hire people, give them targets, milestones, they fail, you fire them. I, it, we can't be emotional. If we, we, need to be, we need to be crazy, you know. The minister needs to be crazy in court. Hire and fire people. Give them targets. If they don't meet it, we don't want to listen to stories. Ask them what they want in the beginning. They tell you we need ABCDE. Provide ABCDE, agree timelines. If they fail, you sack them. I think part of the challenges in the sector is also that people get their tenors renewed. People do what's very minimal, and they, they just move along and, and that's kept us where we are today so i think it's each state um taking its destiny to its hands and those who that and that's the that's the advantage of having a federal system those states which do not have the capacity can then rely on the uh, on the federation I, I i i think that beyond what i've said i think um we need to work more the technical guys the politicians need to work more with the academics the academia. There's need to understand beyond what we know now. What may be those other additional fundamental issues we're not even aware of because we've been discussing some of these issues for 20 years, 30 years, and same issues. So there, maybe there's a bit more than what you and I know. You know, that's what uh, the Silicon Valley does with um, Stanford, I believe. Stanford, so we, we, we need to do a bit more research. But from a practical point of view, it's those issues, transmission, ensure that you and I pay, everyone pays, maybe not you and I, everyone pays, reduces um, electricity theft. The laws are there. Strong, copious provisions are in the Electricity Act. But enforcement is a challenge. You see? Pardon me, so can we have stable power this year? Can we have no, possible? I, I don't think so. I don't, to be honest, I don't think so. Pockets here and there, maybe, but I don't think as a country we will have stable power this year. When I don't you, think so. When you say everyone should get involved in transmission, you mean State, the subnationals? Support, yeah, the subnationals need to support uh, the federation. Everyone, yeah, because if transmission is still weak, we will still have this problem. You just then have stranded power. You have 23,000 megawatts, or you can't transmit because your, your transmission network can only do a, a, a particular quantum, four, five, seven, some will say when it's peak. But there's a presidential initiative with Siemens uh, trying to upgrade all of that infrastructure. But I'm not sure that that alone is sufficient. I think as a, as a, as a country, everyone needs to come together. Every sub-national needs to come together. Uh, or that uh, we'll be discussing this in 20 years. Don't, don't you think that requires a, maybe a state of emergency, given the importance of that sector? I think that's been declared a few times, right? But <laughs> it's not about declaring it. Uh, it's about uh, walking the talk. That's my view. It's not, we don't need to declare anything. We just need to ensure that uh, anyone who doesn't deliver just gets, gets tagged. You have I asked that, question. You have I asked that question. Because, sorry, because if we're talking about productivity, yeah. 
and so that we don't we stop relying on these short-term advances from uh, ways and means from mm -hmm. the central mm -hmm. bank that leads to nowhere mm -hmm. then we have to get this fixed yeah because uh, imagine um 84 percent of businesses in nigeria are micro small and medium scale enterprises and imagine that they spend 40 percent of their cost on electricity i don't understand recently it's increased by over 21 percent already so we're in trouble if we don't do something about it we can't be pro we can't be competitive well, I'd also like you to speak to you know, why the subnationals are not taking advantage of the legislation. But I'm glad you mentioned Siemens. While you're reflecting on that, the criticism against Siemens also is that, look, uh, they're, they're supplying outdated technology to Nigeria in the first place. Uh, uh, while the world is looking at various forms of uh, power supply, solar, hydro, gas, Siemens is also only a company that manufactures equipment and it's not necessarily a company that, is, that has any dexterity in utility, in distribution uh, of power supply. What are your thoughts on this? Okay, so we have a lot of gas. We haven't made the most of it. We are speaking about renewables. I, I don't get. For me, <laughs> let's 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 even get going first before we begin to speak about renewables, because that, that's a different conversation, right? And I have a, I'm, I'm pro Trump when it comes to energy policy. I believe we should transit, but more slowly. I think energy transition should be just, but we don't. We're not going into that today, right? Um, let's make do with what we have and make the best of what we have. Um, otherwise, we'll continue to complain and never make any progress. Yes, Siemens will have its challenges. And I've always been of the view that that, that alone isn't with sufficient, right? We need the subnationals to work with the federal government to achieve success. That, that's the truth. So I also will be here for, for 20 years and you, you'd invite me in, in my 50s, in my 60s to come and have this conversation, I, I think. There's some people who want to know, I mean, and this question might sound a bit basic, but this is where the shoe pinches the average Nigerian. So you need to help us out. And the question is simple. Why do discos turn off and on light intermittently? Who is responsible for this and why? It's as simple, as honest as it comes, but that is what Nigerians like a mood swing okay. want to know. Okay, okay. Mood so, swing. so it's, it's many things. You know, at times they rush on electricity it's a combination of, of equipment challenges so they say okay this is an area we only got we've only got this much power we will give this area for a few hours or a few days and then give that or area a few minutes, or a few or minutes seconds, maybe case, you understand and it could be that they, they've got a challenge at that moment with a particular infrastructure for a particular area so they, they need to uh, constrain down or constrain off or de-energize get it fixed and and it then comes up it goes to it goes to same challenges around not reserving enough and Poor infrastructure, even by the discos. I, I think when the guys bought some of these um, assets, they didn't have the capacity to run them. They just thought, oh, it's like telecoms, we'll, we'll make money, it's like oil and gas, we'll make money. But you need to be more efficient. Anything downstream, whether it's refining, petroleum products, it thrives on efficiency. If you are not efficient and you don't have um, high quality uh, um, infrastructure, are we going to make progress? But don't they have the obligation to give us a shadow? Because this is a service that we are paying for. Give us a schedule. So this week, this is what we're envisaging. On Monday, we can only give you five hours of power supply. So we'll give you from this time to this time so on Tuesday. Plan. So people can plan. Do you know how, how much people struggle with anxiety and all of that because they, don't, they, they can't predict power supply? Okay, well, um, some of it is outside their powers. If, if there's a problem with generation which wasn't planned, it doesn't matter what schedule they're giving you, right? If they don't, if the generators and or the transmission network doesn't supply power, it doesn't matter our schedule. But but that's a good but point. But the generation, they always say they are they are they are giving, but they are not able to take that. No, no. But she read something now, one thousand or he did one thousand megawatts. Seven hundred yeah, megawatts. Yeah, very little because of partly the gas constraints are big, uh, and also there have been challenges with um, arson and people who are yeah, damaging, vandalizing. Uh, van vandalizing infrastructure. So it's, it's difficult. There are rules. Now, I think NERC is probably best uh, regulator when it comes to issuing regulations and all of that. And historically, uh, I think they, they struggled with implementation. I think more recently, I could have been political interference at that time. More recently, they seem to be guns blazing. I don't know if you've noticed. Oh, they are? They are withdrawing licenses. Mm. There's a there's an 11 billion naira um, penalty um, measure taken against a number of those discos. I think all of them because what we do now is a service based tariff system where if you if you get between 18 
16 and say 20 hours or so or more your own tariff is much higher than those who get less i think it's about four bands you know and the discos have played games around those and and neck did notice did their audits and notice and 11 billion and that to, to refund um you and i consumers who've been overcharged so i think neck is waking up more to his responsibility for a long time and if you've had these historical challenges with not enforcing rules maybe there's political inf interference i spoke to someone once who's now left the regulator a lot of people have left the country was saying oh we make decisions we want to wield the big stick and we get a call from from the presidency not this administration we get a call from the presidency saying we shouldn't do what we want to do so the regulator's been it's been weak you know transmission has been abandoned for 20 years gas issues have been there because of the historically poor commercial arrangement poor infrastructure the challenges with nepal taking gas are not paying for it so if you have these historical challenges and the country is quite broke or has been broke until maybe recently i, I don't know are you going to deal with those issues when you need 10 billion dollars every year to yeah. do something. So, two, 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 two questions in one. We, we also have to be fair to the discourse at some point. Those yes. people that are perpetually indebted to discourse, even the presidency was complicit yes. at some point. MDs. Uh, until the president said, Good stop point. embarrassing us, pay these people their money. Mm. There are places that are owing this. So, what do we do about that? And then, how do we ensure that these people realize, these discos realize that this is a contract between us and them? Uh, Kaede was saying, at least give us a shadow. We know there could be. Anything could happen in between, but okay, it didn't happen this time because, okay, something may have happened. But we don't even have an idea. It's like somebody's having a mood swing on, 10 minutes later, but turn it off. You What's be that there are regulations by NERC for some of these things. Yeah. It's just, like I've stated, our problems are not those sort of things, regulations and all of that. Our problems are around implementation and enforcement, right? So I think there are regulations around those issues is just for NERC. I'm sure some of them at, at, at NERC are listening and will should enforce more some of these things. They, they, they've improved in terms of enforcement, but I think that that's a va valid point. Yes, and NEC should enforce the government, all governments at all levels. Yeah, yeah, they the should MDS pay should their debts. Yeah, MDS should pay. The presidency should pay. The and the barracks. And yeah. Everyone should pay. And there's so many other questions in that mix also, Dr. Oni, when you consider, you know, that the um, um, uh, disco said government did not fulfill their own parts of the promises before they got their licenses. But we're going to have true. to leave that and, you know, continue this conversation some other time. Thank you so much, Thank Dr. You. Ayodele Oni, for your time and contributions on the program. Dr. Oni is the partner, Energy Practice Group, Bloomfield LP and commercial lawyer. Thank you so much for Thank coming you on the program. Much, and up next on the show is that big man doing great things. Stay with us. We'll be right back. If anyone points a gun in that direction as a man, I'm not sure what I will do. It, like, it is quite confusing to know what to do exactly. But the gentleman who pointed that gun in that case is right here with us, uh, Mr. Victor Mwogo. We know him as Nkubi, is an honor personality as well as an actor. Mr. Nkubi, thank you for coming on the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Did you pull no. the trigger? Right? Did you? What, what, what were you trying to do with that guy? <laughs> I was only being given an instruction, so I followed the instruction. <laughs> oh, amazing, amazing. Now, let's walk through some of your journey. Um, a lot of people have seen you, either heard you watch you on TV or heard you on radio, uh, seen you in skits and in movies. You're, you're literally everywhere. You've broken all the stereotypes, breaking barriers and boundaries. But it didn't just happen. Because there are people like you who may be given excuses, but you have reinvented yourself and you're now a model in that space. Talk to us about that. Well, um, I, I think the whole um, process, the whole journey started um, from as a little boy, of course. Um, one very funny thing I usually do is um, I get inspired by what I see on TV. Um, I mean, looking up to a lot of actors. And so I'll stand in front of a mirror, surround them, you know, 
reenact some of these things. Mm -hmm. So I, I got so used to it and um, it gets me excited. So I just um, made it a passion that look, I, I think this is the direction I might want to follow. So and um, which eventually, even before I entered the university, I, I've had some, I've had some, a journey through acting as well. I featured in one or two stops. So eventually I went to the university to study theater arts. And then, which of course, um, after my university, so far this is the journey, this is where I found myself. So I know that the, the big question a lot of people would like to ask you, because you've proven that being diminutive in size has nothing to do with attaining your dream as a person. Tell us how you, were able to break that stereotype, look away from all the things that have been targeted at you. I'm sure people have targeted you, looked down on you, uh, concluded about you. How did you walk yourself out of that space and now you've earned your respect? Okay, I think the first point of call is um, growing up. Um, I think my parents actually were more like the driving force for me because um, uh, uh, they gave me the right morals, the right direct directions. They inspired me, if I would rather use that word, inspired me, gave me every reason to believe in myself, first thing first. And um, I think that was the driving point. And um, the society I grew up in, Mafuluku Ushudi, I mean, I appreciate such neighborhood. I was born there, I, I grew up there. A, a very tough um, environment where a words have been thrown at you, random words have been thrown at you, and you can just, um, if you're not, if you're not, um, if you're soft, of course, it, it, could, it could get you emotional. But um, because of the kind of individuals who are, yes, accept it, take it, rebuild it, give it back to them. So it, it made me um, stronger. And then from there, um, I had um, a lot of inspiring people around me because what I, I, I also actually defined for myself is moving around with people who, can, who would rather add value to my life rather than you know the otherwise. Yeah. So I had a lot of inspiring people around me, um, friends, big bro people are referred to as uncles aunties so these individuals also you know helped reshaped um the, the person i am and uh, which of course has led to me st standing out and believing in myself so for and they, i looked at it that okay the journey of me being a little person does not really count here it is about what i can offer so those are just my strong point those are just those, those are just the major thing that that keeps me going well, Kadi, I really don't want to go next. So if you want me to go next, I will. Oh, I could go. I'm excited <laughs> to jump in, really. I will. Uh, Mr. Kube, I'm sure you, you get this question all the time, but that's the question I'm going to ask you. How did you find the confidence to talk to your wife? There you go. Straight up. <laughs> bullseye. <laughs> that's why. Okay. Well, see, the thing is, still about, still referring to the society, I mean, the neighborhood where I grew up, because... You know, each, each time I, I, I talk about myself, I always make references to where I grew up. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. because I mean, when you, when big uncles around you will refer you, go and call that auntie for us. <laughs> yes, like, uh, auntie, that brother, they call you. <laughs> so, I mean, subconsciously, it is putting something in my head that of course I can walk up to any lady. So um, how it all started, she, she reached out to me on them, a social media platform, Facebook, and just on a friendly distance. I was started off as friends, chatting, and from there, um, we, the, the, the social media friendship lasted for a couple of months. And uh, even before then, we, we had a few, we've met, we've met. Then and, um, at some point, I now looked at it, ah, this, she has a very good personality, she's hardworking, she, she, is, um, she has this good sense of humor. Why not just pop the question to her, look, I like you and see how far. She <laughs> may feel wrong things. So, and that was just it. And she said she was going to think about it. So thinking about it has given back to where we are today. Beautiful. And she's beautiful, uh, yeah. she's beautiful. You know what? I'm enjoying this love story. <laughs> it's, it's really beautiful to I, I, I would watch like you a lot. I wish, um, they, I wish they came together. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I watch you a lot on, on, uh, on social media with her, mm -hmm. some of your moments. But let's watch uh, some of the other work you've done. I mean, you're a brilliant person, versatile. So let's just have a little feel of uh, some of your work, and then we'll come back to continue this conversation. Ah, Ross, good afternoon. I bet, give me your um, tilt idea, Beck. One more. Okay. Ross, now 250 now, they be 200. Which <laughs> one be 250 now? Now, now 200. Look, call your wife, I bet. Now, today for yesterday, we'll buy now 200 that buy them. Which one be 250 again? Which one be 250 again? Honey, I'm going to bag up your water. Okay. 
Ross, na 300 now. 300? Na 300 now. Na 250, tell me now, now. Ah. Well, bring him, bring him, bring him, bring him, bring him. Oh, I like that. Ross, I wait my food. Oh, no, hold on, no back call that call. Give me water. I want to pick my call. Hold on, daddy, give me the water. Don't oh, yeah, take, 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 take. You might have to call me. Hello, honey. 400? Oh, get a 400, 400, 400. <laughs> Beautiful. And this is uh, this is a reaction we have watching you. And I'd just like to say thank you uh, for making us smile through the tough times, for giving us a reason to laugh. Mm -hmm. You don't know how much your work has actually impacted people. I think comedians particularly should get some national honor separately. Because <laughs> even though times are hard, when they are hard, when they are good, they always deliver in spite of what they're going through. And, you know, the essence of this conversation is also to challenge some stereotypes, you know, to break all of those unnecessary biases that people have and bring this to people and show that you're doing great stuff. But for the benefit of people who may not understand where you're coming from, I'd like you to speak particularly uh, about your your situation. Is this biology? Some people think, oh, you didn't eat well while growing up and all of that. Because you're a brilliant person, I know you've done research into that. So let's educate people who may not know better, which is again also the essence of this conversation. Okay, um, biology will clearly states it as um, um, a genetic um, issue. But, but, but then genetic also refers to maybe Genetic could also refer to maybe somebody from your family has something, you know, close to this or something related to this. But I, for me personally, sometimes I still question that genetic because this is one. I, there's no trace of um, a little person in my family. I, I ask really? questions. Really? Yes, from really? both my maternal side and my paternal side. I ask questions. Have you ever had, had there, had there ever been a time where maybe um, there's a story about uh, a trace of um, a little person in that family? The answer has always been no. Uh, no rather so I, I, I personally I, I settled for this I usually settle for this like look maybe somewhere along the line genetic I mean somewhere along the line biology must have had its own twist in the course of um, my process mm. that has given birth to a little person so you understand so I, I, but still generally um, and generally accepted they will tell you that it is genetics and um, and that is what it is. Let, let's just hold on to what science says rather right. than me giving my own opinion. <laughs> but, yeah. but what is the appropriate uh, <clears throat> term again? Because I, I like to deal with this when people uh, address you. Mm -hmm. People use different terms. Mm -hmm. I mean, I like the way you handle these things. Even on your handle, you say small start, you know, and stuff <laughs> like that. But what is the appropriate term? Because there are a lot of terms, I don't even want to mention them, but what is the appropriate term to use? Okay, the prop okay, fine. It I would rather, let me say, the dwarf, dwarf remains dwarf. You understand? Dwarf is, remains dwarf. They were being referred to as dwarfs. But um, a particular society, like the Western society, will tell you, look, uh, such name is, um, is diminishing. Don't refer also as dwarfs. Call us little people. But in the long run, look, we are in a very tough society where people would not want to stick with these opinions. Yeah. They would always want to refer you based on the time or the general um, acceptable terms, which is dwarf. So I don't have an issue with you referring me as, okay, that dwarf, you understand? One could relate, um, or that little person. And if in a case where you know my name, call me by my name. So that, that for me, I, I don't have an issue with you referring to me as dwarf, little person, or my name. I, I think that is personally, that is what I want to stick with. Because if we, if we not start looking at them, um, or rather start debating on the right name to call, that might be an issue. You understand? That might be an issue. So we, we're not going to probably end the argument today. Mm -hmm. So let us just stick with you. <laughs> Calling me a, a little person, right. a dwarf, or call me just by my call name. Your name. Let, let's talk about your role in movies and all of that. Uh, how easy it is. Uh, is it quite easy for you to I'm get... I'm not controlling this. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> uh, uh, is it easy for you to get roles? And do you feel that sometimes when they see you as Nkubi, of course, Nkubi is a celebrity. Let's, let's, let's be clear on that first and foremost. So for those who don't know, it's a celebrity. So do, do they see you like, okay, let's just give Nkubi this role at the end of the day, not what Nkubi really wants, or you say, look, I can do this, despite whatever. How do you walk around that situation? Okay, prior before this period, prior before this, the era of um, social media, I mean, it, uh, over time, um, um, little people have always been given, have always been given this, um, 
have always been um, given roles that are rather diminishing, roles that don't really tell true stories about them, or perhaps that don't really define who they are. Um, roles that are um, roles that would rather give a wrong impression about this nature rather than um, what we should think about this nature. Okay, fine. Um, you might end up being offered roles such as a, um, um, a bush baby. Um, it is called in Win Yoruba. Yeah. Um, you know, a very wicked um, herbalist. You understand? Things like this. And um, for me, I have made it a point of God that, look, I, I don't intend settling for this. Yes, I don't intend settling for roles like this because one, it is not going to add any value to my to my nature. And there's an existing um, there's an existing belief about who we are in the society, and this belief is not even right in the first place. The beliefs are negative most times. So me taking up such roles would rather give an impression to this to the viewers watching it that look ah we have said to the, we have said it. These people, this is what they truly represent. You understand? So. Over time, social, um, social media came up, and um, I think that was more like um, the, uh, an opening door for, for us mm -hmm. because um, um, it, it gave room for every individual to showcase what you can offer. I mean, it is more like um, you define your ground, define your goals, set your targets, tell people who you are. And that was where, that is how, I mean, this, some, someone, someone like me have been able to at least explore for people to see. But that still does not take away the fact that in still in the movie industry, a couple of people still settle for these um, roles I just mentioned. But outside that, there are a couple of other movie makers who have also moved away from that niche into realities, mm -hmm. into um, you know, stating the fact that, okay, this person, at least we've seen a couple of them in the society, and this is the life they live. Okay, why not just assign this role to him, which are acceptable roles? So some of them have been able to move away from that niche into accepting and giving normal regular rules to, to little people. And I believe it's a gradual step. We are gradually moving on. And then in the long run, I, I, I believe it will get better. Yeah, because I have that, because, sorry, I have that question, because if I ask you a question, uh, if you watch Game of Thrones, what was the star guy? What's that his name? Peter Dinklage. Amazing. What's that his character? I forgot um, his name. Tyron Lannister. Tyron Lannister. He, he killed it. So I think... Um, they should go beyond all of this. That's why I asked that question. Yeah. Uh, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, in relation to Jeffrey's question, and I know that there is a community of, since you, you would, um, you, you don't mind being called little people, a community of little um, artists um, who are uh, um, in, active in the Nollywood industry. So are you at, at, at that level advocating for auditions to be thrown open such that um, when there are auditions for uh, big projects, you know, the auditions are not limited to normal people. Little people can also be accepted, you know, to participate and, uh, you know, uh, you know, demonstrate their ability to play those roles. This is what I usually say to when um, issues like this come up. Look, we live in a society where, a, a look, we live in a world dominated by average heights. So virtually everything you see around you will happen within happen within average height individuals. We are conspicuous, no doubt, yes. We might just walk into this place and um, you will spot us so easily in the midst of average height people. I, I, I can relate to that, but we, we don't define what people write. Okay. We can't tell them what to write. I mean, it is only based on you using your initiative to say, okay, let me include this. And I would also not want to push for a regular, for maybe for every movie maker to say, okay, we must include a little person in our project. It does not work that way. Okay. It will become monotonous. You okay. understand? So um, I, I always allow people do your thing. Do your thing. But at least for, for areas where a little person will be featured, make sure the role defines the true character of this individual rather than the otherwise. Oh. You understand? Mm -hmm. So this is what, what usually what I, I, I push for. If you could um, rewrite your story in any way, would you change anything? If you would, what would you change? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a realist. I will say I'm a realist. Okay, fine. Okay, I've accepted my fate today as a little person. But if reincarnation does exist, in my next world, I don't want to appear this way. I'll be very sincere with you guys. Let me have a taste of what average height looks like. Okay. You understand? But I, I appreciate the nature of myself, no doubt.
and I'm not God, but I appreciate the athletes have been able to use it well. Mm -hmm. So, but if recognition does exist, I'll say, okay, let me let me have a taste of what um, average height people do have. Six feet. I don't. Maybe uh, it doesn't really matter as long as I'm tall. <laughs> so I don't, I don't, as long as I'm tall, just add it ahead. So that is just what I might want to rewrite. But everything that must have happened in my life, I, it is something I would still want to, you know, um, you know, appreciate. Particularly it, your wife. Mm. My wife, definitely, yes. <laughs> Especially at least re, um, have as part of my next world. So. Mm. So that's just it. Amazing. We're super excited to have this conversation yeah. because you've broken the stereotype. Look at Peter as well as what's his name, Tyron now in the movie. Um, you don't look at him as a little man. Uh, when you look at the excellence he brings to the table, which is what you're doing in this space. And we hope that uh, story writers and script writers will be able to look beyond what you say uh, you talked about. Look. Just give me the script. Let me interpret this story. Don't don't stereotype me and put me in a box. But we must thank you, Mr. Victor Mwagu, popularly known as Nkubi, on a personality actor. Thank you so much for yeah, gracing the show. You. Thank We're you. We're super delighted to have you. Thank you for coming on the program. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, well, that's the very first uh, for the week. Uh, it's a Monday. And uh, I will start, I will end from where we started. We hope that in the next few days or hours, we'll hear the good news that those children uh, those students have been released uh, from the abductors. That's exactly what we're looking forward to. But we must thank you for being part of the show. Thank you for your time and company. I'm Jeffrey Uzama. Well, no matter where you are, no matter the circumstances you find yourself, remember that you can rise above them and make the best of it. And speaking of which, do that this week. Join us again tomorrow when we we'll bring you another bumper package. I am Bukola Kuka. And if you need something to cheer you up in this very difficult time, just go Unkubi underscore official on Instagram at Crossboard. If you want to have a good laugh, I promise you, you will have a good laugh. I am Kyrie to kill it. Goodbye. Bye bye.